cool. Day, a day that um, 
people that's going there that want to volunteer for that city or that state that they're going to, excuse me, um, will do an outreach for that community. So with the, when the nomination of Pearl Baptist leave, uh, we're hoping to leave it in a better place than we, we arrived there and we did an outreach. And so since this year the convention is not happening, what the nomination has asked us to do as churches across the United States is to take that day and do some type of impact in our community. Um, so we're designating that day here at the church. Um, that's July 18th. That's on Saturday. Uh, so that's three weeks from yesterday, I believe. Um, we're going to have a, kind of an outreach day. We'll have everything scheduled on what we're going to do. Um, kind of talked about a few things this morning we may incorporate into that day. Um, but we'll get some more information out in the next couple weeks. Um, but if you wonder what Impact Springfield is, it's going to be a day that we're going to focus. Uh, we're going to continue to stay safe, social distancing, and and all of that, but we still want to be able to, to make an impact in our community, um, do an outreach, and be able to join Fort Baptist across this country on that day uh, to do that as well. Um, and then that following Sunday on the 19th, we had scheduled for some time. Uh, Leroy Smith, he's actually a member of the Horse Valley Church, he'll be here. Uh, he represents Gideon's International, and he'll be here with us that Sunday. So, uh, be much prepared for those services. Like I said, we have some other things scheduled and planned in the additional months to come. Um, um, everything is subject to change. We know that due to virus and things get worse or things change. Um, but we're going to go ahead and, and proceed with, uh, with our schedules and events coming up. And we'll post and if there's a change, we'll, we'll let everyone know. Um, so this time we'd like to uh, go into our worship service today. Uh, and Mark McCarty, will you open us up in prayer for us? Our dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've allowed us to come back once again to worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray that you'll keep you in the center of this worship service this morning. Pray that you'll bless those that minister to us through their singing this morning. Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. And at this time, we're to sisterless. Yeah. 
remember my son Rick, he's back on the road again. He went back to work this week. So um, there's been a lot of <clears throat> problems they've had with people hijacking the trucks and things like that. So I guess even some of them are carrying weapons. So just remember him.
Bibles with you this morning. Turn with me to Revelations chapter 21. Revelations chapter 21. It's the last book of the Bible. And uh, Revelations has 22 books, so it's the second to last book of the last book of the Bible. So it uh, should be easy to find to start to wake them back. And uh, if you turn there, Revelations is written by uh, John the Apostle. Uh, some refer to him as John the Revelator. Is the author of the Gospel of John. And uh, you find John 3.16, you see him as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Um, and he was one of the ones that ran to the tomb that morning when he heard the, the words from the, the, the ladies that had went there that him and Peter had ran. Um, he also read the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And here in Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, uh, which is also the last book of the Bible, um, you see the book of prophecy of the New Testament. And so a lot of times when we think of prophecy, we think of the Old Testament and the prophets of old and all the things that they prophesied being the words of God, uh, saying about the Messiah and the things to come. Um, but here we have a whole book, 22 chapters um, of revelations that, that John, when he was exiled on the island of Patmos, uh, that he was able to record the, the visions and the things uh, that God showed him there. Um, and at the time that he wrote to the seven churches in Asia that we have today, um, to know uh, of the things to come. And, and the book of Revelations, uh, a lot of times it, it's hard to understand. Um, I'm going to jump around in a, a few things this morning out of this book. Um, it can be controversial at times because we don't completely understand everything and people begin to get their own opinions about the book. Um, but all that we know for sure is God's going to work everything out. And just like the entire Bible, everything is true. It's God's Word. And as we look at here in, in Revelations, uh, we want to start verse, or chapter 21 today um, to see that God is going to make all things new. And I thought this would be a, a big message this morning as we look at everything that's going around in the world today to know that God is going to make all things new. So if you want to follow along with me, we're in Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 1. It says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth was passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. And be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying, nor shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give unto him that thirst of a, the fountain of water. Of life free. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, and the unbelieving, and the abominable, and the murderers, and the whoremongers, and the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and the liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let us pray this morning. Your Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you today. We thank you for all your blessings that you've bestowed on us in life. We thank you for bringing us again together today. And as we look at this world today, and we know that things are, um, things look bleak out there today, Lord. May we know of a new hope and know of a hope eternity that we have with you, that you are going to make all things new. This morning, I just ask that you speak with your spirit in our hearts, those that have gathered here today or those that are watching um, online with us this morning, wherever they may be. May your spirit stir up within us today and be that comfort that we need in these times of trials that we face in life. We love you today. We give this time of service to you. We put it all in your hands. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we look in Revelation chapter 1, we see that John is speaking based upon what he is seeing that God is, is, is showing him there. And I thought about this last night as I was preparing this and reading through this on the back of what had to be like to be John. You know, here in, in Earth, you know, we, we read the promises of Christ. John was there. He was one of the apostles. He wrote one of the four Gospels. And he writes about these things 
that, that Christ promised. He writes them in John. He was, the, 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 the Gospel of John actually writes more about those latter days when, when Christ was with the disciples up in the upper room and all these, these things that he was bestowing on them and telling them. John writes all this detail, and John knew about these promises that, that Christ had made while he was here on earth. But God gave him a little glimpse on what it was going to be like in the end days. Not just the end days. God gave him a glimpse on what it's going to be like for eternity for the believers. Those of us that believe and, and profess and claim Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He got to see these things. And these things that he saw, that he wrote down in this book. And I just want to take some verses here out of, of chapter 21 to give us encouragement and hope. Because here, when we put ourselves in John's shoes, and, and if you join us on Sunday nights, you, um, as we study through the Gospel of Mark, um, we went through kind of the, the, the sight of the disciples and all these lessons that the disciples have been learning along the way as their faith has been being encouraged and, and in a way preparing them for what they were going to face when they were going to be the apostles and they weren't going to have Christ anymore by their side. And many of those disciples, they would be persecuted. John is one here that was exiled all alone on the island of Patmos. And, and when things were looking dim for him, when he experienced the loss of many of those early Christians that he stood beside on the battle line, so to speak, um, and he stood and he shared the gospel with and had been persecuted and put to death um, and was martyrs for their faith, God gave him a little glimpse that John is all worth it. Today, I want us to have that same mindset, that it's all going to be worth it. That today, that, that everything that we face today, that we know is going to be worth it after all. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth was passed away, and there was no more sea. This earth is corrupt today. This earth is a broken world today. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of pleasures in this world. There's a lot of beautiful things in this world. God's creation is beautiful. We can look out and, and see the sun shining and the birds chirping and the trees and the flowers blooming and then the Grand Canyon and all these other things that God created with his handiwork in his hands. We see each other that God created with his handiwork in his hands. But this earth is a broken world. I think that's it. That's an issue that we have in society, even today. Everything that we go upon and we look upon the news and, and we look at what's happening today, and everyone has an idea how to fix a broken world. And I think that we should, by all means, be able to, to share the love with each other and encourage each other and do the best that we can in this world. But the truth of the matter is this world is going to continue to be broken. You know why? Because there's broken people in it. Like you and I. We're all broken. And until we came to Christ, we were all broken. It's only Christ that can put the pieces back together again that, that we've made a mess in our life. The, the sins that we've committed, the wrong doings, the choices that we've made in life. Only God can put those pieces back together. And unless this world turns to God as a whole, this world will continue to be broken. This is a broken world. But God promises us through his prophet, as we see here, as John <coughs> prophesying to us, that this world is going to pass away. God is making a new heaven and a new earth where we will spend eternity with him, where that is not going to be broken anymore. And why is it not going to be broken? Because we're going to be with him. How are we able to be with him? Because the Son died on the cross for our sins and to make remission. The Bible says that the only remission for sin is through the shedding of the blood. The Old Testament, the sacrifices, and all those that were shed was all leading up to Christ dying on the cross to make remission of sin so that we can have forgiveness and spend eternity. It's the only way. But we have a hope of this broken world. And I said a few weeks ago that it seems like the longer we live in life, the, the more that we go through in life, the more heartaches that we experience in life, the more heaven seems appealing to us. Now, heaven should have always been appealing to us. But I think we can all profess that maybe when we were a teenager or when we were young, heaven wasn't on our mind. It should have been. Maybe it was, and, and I hope that many of us were saved at a young age. But our mind was so focused on other things in this world, was it not? Our focus was maybe a chasing the guys chasing girls or girls chasing guys or uh, what we were going to do with, for life and, and a job or education and, and, and everything else. That was our focus. It, it we're all honest. You know? But the longer we live in life and the more that we realize that this world is corrupt, the more that we realize that, that this world is broken, the more appealing heaven seems. Does it not? Yeah. Even as Christians, the longer we live, the sweeter heaven seems. And the more 
be our home, and it's going to be our home eternity, for eternity. It seems a little bit sweeter. It seems something that, that we want to strive for in life. It's that hope that we have for eternal life that we can share in this world, this broken world that we experience in life. But until we experience in life that understanding that we need Christ in life, that this world is broken, we can't fathom in our mind what God is preparing for us one day. As we begin to understand that, and, you know, Revelation can be confusing. I think we can all agree to that. It can be confusing reading that and trying to understand that and putting things together. Uh, and it's not my purpose here today to confuse. Uh, God is not the author of confusion. Uh, and that's not what we're trying to do today. But we're trying to pull out Scripture to understand the hope that we have eternity within today. And that the things in this world may get us down. And, and whether you believe that we're in the latter days today, maybe we are. If we're not, I think we're getting pretty close to them today. That we have this hope and this promise of this new heaven and this new earth that God is preparing for us. John says that there, will, there was no more sea. You ever think about that? that there's a couple of things that we can reference. Now, John earlier here in Revelation talked about a, a beast coming out of the sea. But when we think about the sea, we think about something that is dangerous, something that's unpredictable, something that, that causes fear and, and life. But think about the disciples when they were out on the boat and Christ was asleep in the boat. They were fearful because of the storm and the winds and everything that was upon them. We think of the unpredictability about being in the sea and being in the midst. So there's not going to be any more sea. There's not going to be any more fear. And we're going to talk about here in a second all the things that there won't be. But there won't be any of that fear, that unpredictability that we have in life. Right now, if we sit down, you know, when, when we left church in the end of February, we had no idea what we would return to when we came back. And our last Sunday was called the first Sunday of March. We had no idea what we would return to when we come back. When we come back, not only to a, a different, I say congregation, some of us meeting online and other things at that point, but we return back into the House of Lord in a different setting in this country. This country is different than it was at the beginning of the year. This country is, is different than it was last year. For a lot of things leading up to it, but it it's a little bit different. And I think we can all of meet whether, whether there's some fear and unrest inside of us, but we know that across this world and across this country, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of unrest, and there's a lot of uncertainty. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We talk about scheduling and plans and things that we have for this year, and all that can be turned upon its head in a couple weeks. We know that. And because of that, you know, we don't like uncertainty. The stock market doesn't like uncertainty. We don't like uncertainty. But there's not going to be any answers. We can rely on what God is telling us that there's not going to be any more of that unrest, that fear, the, the stain, those uh, tear stained pillows at night, that the unrest of, uh, of the depression, the anxiety, and everything that we can bog us down here on earth. All of that will be passed away. But we will be able to spend eternity with Him. Verse 2 and 3, it says, I, John, saw the holy city of New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride and born for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. When I look at that, he talks about this new Jerusalem. What was Jerusalem? It was the, the holy city, right? It, it was there. It was the capital of all the, of Israel. It was a holy city. And right there in Jerusalem was the temple. And before the temple was the tabernacle. The temple was more the, the permanent dwelling. The, the tabernacle was what the children of Israel carried about for those 40 years in the wilderness. And uh, for many years in, 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 in Jerusalem, that's all they had until Solomon built the temple. But the temple represented the place of God. The most holy city in J Jerusalem. And within the most holy city was the temple, or the tabernacle, which represented God himself. And within that, there was a portion of blocked off in the back that was considered the holies of holies. It was the most holiness place here on earth. It was where God dwelled here on earth. And, and we know, reading through the Old Testament priests, that they went in with sin in their life, they would be struck dead. Within the holies of holies, with the Ark of the Covenant, and if man touched them with their bare hands, they would be struck dead. That's why they had the long poles that they would carry about. It represented the pureness and the holiness of God in the simple 
your computer, good job, to the closest of God. And there in the tabernacle or the temple, on the outskirts, you saw all the sacrifices and everything made for the remission of sin leading up. But here, God is telling John, or showing John, he says, in this new Jerusalem, he says in verse 3, he said, I heard great glorious, behold, the tabernacle of God is with me. You see, in the Old Testament, the only way that they could even be with God was be there at the temple, in the tabernacle. And that was the place that they got permission to sin. That was the place that they could go and the priest could do it. As we know, when we read in the Bible and the Gospels, when Christ died upon the cross and he gave his last breath and he shouted out, it is finished. And the earth began to quake and things began to get dark. Then that curtain that separated the holies of holies from the rest of the temple of mankind was ripped from top to bottom. God was released. He wasn't confined anymore within that holies of holies. That last sacrifice was made for all mankind. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and it went out. And that same Spirit is available for us today. He lives with inside of us. We don't have to gather. We don't have to go to a, a temple to offer sacrifices. A priest don't have to go on our behalf because the Son of God goes on our behalf. When we were able to meet in your person, many of our congregation that, that may be meeting at home with us today, the Bible says we're two or three together in his name, there you will be in the midst. We're still gathering within the spirit today. We don't have to meet within the temple. You see, God has given us his spirit. But when we live eternity with him, we're going to be with him. It says that he's going to be our God and we're going to be his people. We're going to be at the feet of God, in the presence of God. And it said there in verse 2, it says, And a bride adorned for her husband. I thought about this. I preached several years ago about kind of the, the Jewish customs and, and all of these things that, that, the, that the Jews had for the marriage ceremony and leading up to the marriage ceremony that, that partakes in that. I want to read a few verses going well, back to chapter 19 of Revelations. It says, and I heard, uh, this is in Revelation chapter 19, verse 5, and I heard as it was a voice of great multitude and the voice of many waters, and as a voice of the mighty thunder, and saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God, omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she shall be arrayed in fine linen. And clothed in white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Right, written, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And so there's talk about this marriage supper and this, and this bride being ready for her husband. The Bible talks about Christ, the Son of God, being the husband. And us as the church, us as the Christians, us as the redeemed being the bride of Christ. And we say that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And, and even in our American culture, it's hard to wrap our mind around that, what that means. Uh, that, that we are the bride of Christ and Christ is going to be our husband. There's a lot of references that we don't have time this morning to look at all the different references in the Bible that refers to this and how it all plays in. But briefly this morning, if we look at Jewish custom, the reason that he was giving this, just like throughout the Bible, we see that Christ used and God would use that similar things to be able to create a better understanding of what God was doing. And this is just one of those examples. If we hear preachers today get up, when we get up and we, we would like to use an analogy or an example so we can better understand the Word of God. Christ right? used those, he used parables, he used other things. And this is another one of those examples, uh, analogies that, that God would use and Christ would use to refer to in the last days. And refer to as the church being the bride and Christ being the groom. You see, in Jewish custom, there was a in most cases, that the Jewish father of the groom would select the bride for, for, for his son. Now you may say, well, that wasn't fair. In today's custom, it's probably not a lot fair. The, 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 the wives didn't have much say in that for, for involved in what was going on. But when we think about that in Scripture, I want you to know today, now don't, don't be focused too much on, uh, on the custom of that, but I want you to know today 
that if you're sitting here today, if you're watching online, God has chosen you. God has sent his son down to this earth for you and I. I don't care what you see when you look in the mirror. I don't care what others say about you, what you think and say about yourself. The Almighty God could have scrapped his creation, but he didn't do that. He looked not only in the past and the time, but he looked into the future. He saw you and I as a song that when, when he was hanging on the cross, that we were on his line. That he loved us so much that he put a plan together that he chose us so that we could spend eternity with him. The Bible talks about the elect, and, and it can be very confusing. I'm not going to get into the whole the, the whole portions of that. But know what the Bible referring to is that we as the elect is that we have been chosen by God. That's what that means. That we have been chosen by God. Not that there's just a certain few that's been chosen, but the Bible says that it's God's will that all men come to repentance. And that if we choose them, well, we have to understand that He has chosen us. And Jewish custom that there had to be a price that was paid for the bride. There was some kind of commitment. There was a, a marriage covenant that went in. And a lot of times we think of a dowry. There was a price that had to be paid, an agreement that was made to be bought for that bride, for the, the husband. You see, today there has been a price that had been paid for you and I as the bride of Christ, as the church. The Bible says, Paul says in Romans, for all sin comes short of the glory of God, but the wages of sin is death. So the price had to be paid so we could spend eternity with him. Christ had to be paid for forgiveness of sin. And as we've already mentioned today, the only way that Christ could be paid and forgiveness of sin is remission is through the shedding of blood. So Christ had died on the cross. Through the shedding of blood. A price had to be paid for this marriage to come forward. And this price was paid for you and When we think of all the prices and all the things on earth, God paid the ultimate price for the earth, but when we think of the person, God has paid the ultimate price for you. And he's paid the ultimate price for our children. He's paid the ultimate price for our grandchildren. He's paid the ultimate price for our neighbors. And everyone that's living in this broken and corrupt world, a price has been paid. The other part of this marriage Jewish custom is after this marriage custom went on, they were kind of betrothed, throw, kind of engaged. This was kind of the, the situation when uh, Mary and Joseph, we see in the Gospels, when the, the Holy Spirit came down and, 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 and entered into the womb of Mary, and she was um, she began to, to bear the child. Joseph and, and, and Mary, they were just kind of engaged, espoused to one another, betrothed to one another, we see here. And during this time, the husband, or the soon-to-be husband, typically goes and prepares uh, a place to bring them to right home. Whether it's building a, 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 a nice building or whether it's building a, a lean to behind what his father asked, whatever it is, the husband goes and prepares a place so he can go and get married and bring his wife home so they can spend happily in what happened like her. So but it's used custom that they had. Christ speaks to them. Christ told the disciples when they were in the upper room. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. And you see, Christ, even though he died on the cross, he was risen on that third day. We celebrate a resurrection Sunday. And after appearing to me for 40 days, he ascended into heaven. But he ascended into heaven. Why? To prepare a place for you. There's been a building project going on for 2,000 years. Can you just imagine what heaven is going to be? This new heaven and this new earth, this new Jerusalem that we talk about today, this building project that's been going on for 2,000 years plus, it's all for you and I. It's all being built for a place to bring the bride of Christ, us, to spend eternity with him. You know, one of the things that we read, and I read here in, in Revelation chapter 19, it talks about the bride being put in line for the white linens. We think about even today in American culture and in other cultures and during marriages, the bride would wear white. It represents purity. It represents clean, cleanness. The 
And we think about that, that, that even scripturally it talks about the bride wearing white. Um, it talks about, uh, I think we read that there in Revelation chapter 21, it talks about the, the white being the, the righteousness of the saints. I was reading through some scripture last night, Revelation chapter 11, I think it talked about when he was opening the seals, uh, talked about one of the seals about the saints wearing the robes of white. And so we have all these references to white and, and, and pureness. And, but as Christians, when we think about our past, when we think about our sin, we don't think of ourselves very clean. We don't think about when we're involved in, in things in this world. We don't think about the, the, the cleanliness that white represents. When we look in here sometimes, we see things and we see our past. But we have to understand that the only way of forgiveness is through God's sake. But there's another step of forgiveness. A lot of times we talk about forgiveness, we talk about it this morning. But God doesn't just offer forgiveness. That's the first step. He also offers the fact that He has forgotten our sins. See, a lot of times we can forgive one another, but we still have a hard time forgiving maybe what someone else did to us, right? You know, we may forgive, but to forgive is a little bit harder. God says that not only does he forgive, but he forgets. Brother Charlie Cryer, a pastor over here at Sunset, uh, did a devotion yesterday at the state meeting. Um, out of Psalms chapter 103, when he talks about that God has separated sins as far as the east is from the west. And he ran to mention Brother uh, Me, who was pastor here for some time, and you. Uh, know him, and uh, he, he made a comment that he said, and I don't know if any of you remember this, he said, the thing about the east and the west, if you, if you go from north to south, you can say how many miles it is to the north portion of the world, and then it becomes going south again, or you know how many miles it is going south, but when you try to measure the east from the west, it's never ending, if you just go west, you'll never find the end of going west, you just keep on going west around the globe, right? You go west, you just keep on going west. If you decide to go east, you're just going to keep on going east. I never, never heard that analogy, uh, but he shared that yesterday with us during the devotion. And I thought about that and incorporated with this and the whiteness that God has forgotten our sins and thrown it as far as the east is from the west. Understand that day when God calls his children home. Well, we're a white, not because of anything that we've done. Anything that we can forgive or forget our sins, but God offers forgiveness, and God offers the fact that He forgets our past. A lot of times we're stuck in our past. A lot of times that we can't see what we can rise above. A lot of times we can't see what we're stuck in. We're stuck in a situation that we don't know how to get ourselves out of. But God makes a way. God always makes a way. God sees us through the eyes of His Son. And he sees us, and in that day we were a real wide. And the last point here I'll make on, uh, on this Jewish custom is this marriage supper that we talked about here in chapter 19. The fact that there will be a marriage supper. It's a celebration that would happen, that all the family would come in and they would celebrate the marriage of these two that had come together. And in that day, when God calls his children home, that we will spend eternity with them in this marriage supper. That all the saints of the past, and we'll all be gathered there celebrating the marriage of the church with Christ. Now the thing about that is, is we don't know the day, but we know the hour. And the Jewish custom is the fact was the only person that knew the day of the hour in that custom was the father of the groom. Because it's up to the father of the groom to know that all the preparation has been made. All, everything that he went there for his building project, for his new life, was done. And so in our Jewish custom analogy, the same thing is happening today. We don't know when God is going to call us home. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week. But let me tell you, God knows the day and he knows the hour. And Christ is just waiting on, on the end of the seat for the Father to say, Son, go get your children this time. It is time to bring the children home. For us to have this marriage supper together. For us to spend eternity with Him. Now let's circle back into what we talked about when we, we began our discussion this morning. The fact that He's making all things new. That, that, that when we continue to read here, it says in verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be no more pain. For the former things are 
were passed away. And he that is set upon the throne saith, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write these words, for they are true and faithful. Sometimes we get so stuck in what the situation is for you, that we get so defeated, that we feel depressed, that the anxiety of this world, this world bears on us, whatever the, whatever the situation that we are in, and we realize that we can't get out of it ourselves. Have you ever tried to forgive yourself? Have you ever tried to stop sinning yourself? Can't do it. Only God can help us. You know, get us out of sin. Only God can help us forgive and forgive. Only God can help us out of situations and make all things new. But God is promising us in that day and for eternity. He says, I shall wipe all the tears from your eyes. And I thought about the emotion that God has instilled in us in creation. Why do we cry? Some of us may cry in, in times of, of uh, excitement or in times of good times. But most of us cry in times of sorrow and despair. We cry during the, 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 the loss of a loved one. We cry, we cry uh, maybe because of stress and everything that, that may be going on in our life. We cry because of maybe just physical pain that we go in. It's an emotion that pours out in crying. But God said, they ain't me no more about it. All of the stuff that we go through today, that emotion of crying, ain't going to be in heaven. And he goes into detail when he's telling John, he says, there's no more death. There's not going to be a need for funeral directors in heaven. There's not going to be a need for, for, for curses in heaven. Why? Because there will be no more death. There will be no more parting over there. It says there will be no more sorrow nor crying. There will be no more tear-stained pillows. There will be no more emotions wrapped up in our life uh, of tears pouring down from our face of not knowing where to turn to why. Because we're going to spend eternity with him. It says there will be no more pain. There will be no more physical aches and pains that we go through in life. There will be no more emotional pains that we go through in life. There will be no more pains that others cause upon us or each other in life. There will be no more pain. All of this is a reminder that we live in a broken world. But God is making we have that hope and that encouragement today. I want to end with this. Um, if I jump over here to, to the end of chapter 21, verse, verse 22, it says, and I saw no temple thereof, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon, to shine, for it, for the glory of God, did list the light hit, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do, do bring the glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall be shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations unto it, and there shall be no wise enter into it. Any that defile neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. You see, right in the middle of that, for the sake of time, we don't have this, but right in the middle of chapter 21, when John saw just a little bit of what this new heaven was going to be like in the new earth, he talks about Jerusalem and the twelve gates. He talked about the, the foundations and talked about uh, streets of gold and, and the pearls and, and all the, the gems that we hold precious here that God is using to build heaven and eternity. Take some time to read through chapter uh, 21 today. You'll see all these things that, that, that the best that John can put into words of what heaven is going to be like. And then at the end of that, he concludes all of this in chapter 21. He says there's not going to be a moon there's not going to be any nightfall. There's no need to lock and shut the gates at night. Because the sun's going to shine forever. Because we're going to be with the sun. That's oh, yeah. We're going to be with God's sun forever. It's going to shine. There's not going to be any more dark times that we experience here on earth. But when, we, when we think about dark, we think about fear, right? I've got to share this with you, Gavin. 
that Gavin, Gavin helps us in the house. We have chickens, but you know that. We have a nightly routine. We go out and water the flowers and make sure that the, the chickens have food and water. We have some rabbits to make sure they have food and water. And, and sometimes if, if we get caught up with everything going on, it starts to get dark by 9 o'clock, and we've got to go out at 9, 9 30 to make sure everything's fed, and it's dark out there. And so Gavin is a little scared in the dark. And uh, so the other day, he, he went out, he didn't see me, I was out there, and he yelled out the door, Dada, Dada, he didn't see me. And so I thought it would be funny to do some kind of like screeching sound in the dark. Gavin didn't think it was so funny. Rochelle was in the house on the couch talking to her mom, and, and she says all she knows is Gavin comes running in, screaming, shouting, and is in the fetal position on the couch. And, and Gavin, that's not typical Gavin. We don't see him do that. And he was in such fear because not only the darkness, you can't see what's out there, but just hearing some sounds. And, and most of us can relate uh, the fear that we have. Uh, you know, you don't walk through a haunted house during the day. You know, you have nighttime. You know, there's fear that's wrapped up in this nighttime. You know, a lot of times we may not lock our doors during the day, but we lock our doors at night. You know, or some of us lock our doors during the day as well. But it's the nighttime you have to worry about. God's saying there's not going to be any more nighttime. There's not going to be any more fear within the night. And the things that, that, that make noises in the night that we don't know. We're going to spend eternity with Him. It's going to be bright days. Every day is going to be a bright day, a bright shining day. It's going to be a joyous day. The things that we're experiencing and heard from day to day. But there is sorrow in this this world today. But be of good cheer, because Christ will come again. Be of good cheer today. That all of these things on earth is temporary. All of these things are going to pass away. And if you put your hope in this world. You put your faith in objects of this world, they're all going to pay away. Let me ask you this question as we bring this to a close. Let me ask you this question. If every possession you own was gone tomorrow, what would you have left? Every possession, everything that you want, whether it's money, whether it's property, whether it's cars, whether it's clothes, toys, Boats, whatever you have, everything was gone. What's left? Faith. We've got faith. We've got each other. We've got family. But most of all, we have God. And where does He live? He lives inside of us. Until He comes back and we live eternity with Him, He's living inside of us today. You see, He didn't leave us hopeless in this world. Let's say, come back to the camp. Dan, if you would come up. He didn't leave us hopeless in this world to navigate this broken world alone. The sadness and despair that we were going through today in this world, he didn't leave us hopeless. He's offered the opportunity for us to call out to his son to ask him to come into our hearts. See, that's what salvation is all about. We spoke about this the last several weeks. But the Bible, it can sound complicated. Revelation can be complicated, but it's as easy as this. God loves us. He sent his son down so we can have a relationship with him. And all we have to do is accept his son. It's that easy. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. We can, we can get so well down with revelations and prophecy and all these other things. But know that God wants to have a relationship with he wanted it so bad that he would really come down and get upon the flesh. He could experience the heartaches that we go through. Know today, if there's not a thing that you go through today, that you experience today, that God himself, as a son of man, didn't experience what he was here on the soul. There's no other idol, false god, no other powerful person in this earth that people worship idolize it's like one true living God. Not just a creator God, but the God that came down to live amongst me. To take on flesh, to experience the heartaches and the despair, but to pay the ultimate cross so we can spend it with you. The end of verse chapter 21 talks about the land of the life. Revelation talks about the names that are written in the land for the life. When we accept Christ into our heart, whether it's in an altar of prayer, whether it's in the seats where we're sitting, whether it's at home on the couch, wherever it may be, our name is written in the land for the life. You may say, why? How is that possible? Is this book really true? Is it, how do you even 
that simple. You've accepted the relationship that God wants to have with you. It's that simple. Because on the opposite side, if you're not living for God, you never claim to claim Christ as your Savior. You're living for this world. And the Bible says the prince of this world is the devil. The hard time this world has is to understand that if you're not serving God, you're serving the devil. And he says, Why am I not serving the devil? Why are you serving God? If you're not serving God, you're serving the pleasures of the flesh. You're serving and chasing after the things of this world. You're buying into the lies of Satan. And if we're not serving God, we're serving our flesh. We're serving sin. And as hard as it is to swallow, we read today in chapter 21, when it talks about the murderers and the whoremongers and all these things, you say, well, I'm not, I never killed anybody. I've never done anything so great. But it also says the lie.